testing. Can you hear me? Not quite. All right. Bring this up higher. I feel like every time I step up here and try to figure out the mic, I'm doing a dress rehearsal. <laughs> oh, friends, this morning I'm very happy that we get to take a look at one of the uh, very important books, I would say, in Scripture, but yet still a book that seems to trouble many of us. The book of Jonah. The book of Jonah. Thank you, Marsha, for reading our Scripture reading this morning. I want to start by saying today that there is a Jonah in all of us. You're here today at church. I am here as well with you. And I am a Jonah. We are all Jonahs in some way or another. Now, I'm no prophet, and I've never been swallowed by a fish, but you'll get the point of my sermon at the end. Today, as we pray, I do have somewhat of a special request. Just yesterday, I came across a news article that uh, mentioned that uh, the headline was that they were searching for 52 men were part of the Navy in Indonesia. They were doing a submarine exercise and disappeared off the coast of Bali. 52 men trapped in a submarine. It is believed that the submarine is somewhere in the depths of between 1,900 feet to 2,300 feet um, in the ocean. The last I saw of the article was that their oxygen supply was running out. This was just yesterday. They had only 72 hours left of breathable air. And so the news article mentioned that these men need a miracle. And so this morning, I would like to invite you to kneel with me as we pray to consider these men and pray for a miracle for them. My heart aches imagining how hard it would feel to be underground knowing you're running out of air. So, will you pray with me? Loving Father in heaven, we know that whenever tragedy strikes, your heart aches for your own people you've created. And today, as we are on our knees, we consider not ourselves, but these men, 52 of them. Each one representing a family, a home. One of them was recently married. But yet, they're trapped in a submarine. Father, we don't know the outcome of the situation. But we pray that you may intervene and rescue these men from the vast ocean that they find themselves in now. Father, we know that you have, on occasion, dug into the depths to rescue men. And Father, these men can be rescued also. I pray, Lord, that you be with the systems, the instruments that are being used to locate these men. And I pray, Lord, that things may work out so that these men can be returned home to their families. As the news article suggested, these men need a miracle. And so, Father, we come to a miracle-working God who can do the impossible. And we ask you, Lord, to intervene, to rescue the perishing and care for the dying. We know that you're a merciful God. And so, Lord, we rest everything now in your hands. Be with the message. Be with the messenger. Father, all I am, I give to you. And I ask that you speak to us now. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. Don't stop praying for these men, brothers and sisters. They really need it. We are in the book of Jonah. And Jonah, his story is somewhat similar. His submarine was not made of iron. His submarine was a fish. God used a fish to rescue 
a faulty prophet. And the title of my message is Running from Grace. The story of Jonah is not isolated to the book of Jonah, by the way. The prophet, by some accounts, arrived on the scene sometime after the prophet Elisha and right before Amos and Hosea. Sitting on the throne in Israel was King Jeroboam, Jeroboam during the time of uh, Jonah's life. Jeroboam was not a good king. We read of him in 2 Kings chapter 14 and verse 24. This king, 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 24, the Bible tells us, and he did that which was evil in the sight of the Lord. He departed not from all the sins of Jeroboam, the first, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin. He was a wicked king in Israel. He was on the throne in Israel leading God's people, and yet still, he was a wicked king. This was a time for Israel, by the way, of economic prosperity. Under Jeroboam's reign, the rich were getting richer, the poor were getting poorer. There were a number of social justice issues, and uh, the prophets Amos and Hosea would begin to plead for justice in Israel. Jonah saw all these things. The courts didn't help the cases of those who pled for their cause. In Israel, things were very bad from a civil standpoint and worse from a religious standpoint. There was great need for reformation in Israel. Here we see Jonah being used by God in his own homeland. 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 26. The Bible says that Jeroboam took action based on the words of Jonah the prophet. 2 Kings chapter 14, verse 26. This Jeroboam restored the boundary of Israel from Lebo Hamath to the Sea of Arabah, according to the word of the Lord, the God of Israel had spoken through his servant Jonah, son of Amittai, the prophet of Getapher. Getapher was not very far from Nazareth, where Jesus would later arrive. Jonah had work to do in his own hometown. He had wise counsel for a wicked king. And a border was made. The border of Israel was restored. Jonah was being used by God in his hometown. But then when you read the book of Jonah, Jonah chapter 1, verse 1, we read these words. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Arise, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. Jonah's assignment was not just confined to Israel. God was asking him to do something else. And the word of the Lord came to Jonah at a time where he had some very challenging, cruel enemies on the other side of the Mediterranean, and on the, well, not, not the Mediterranean Sea, but about 550 miles from where Israel was. Jonah had a mission to complete. Nineveh needed to be warned. And Jonah had a choice to make. Nineveh, that great city, was one of the great wonders of the world during that time. Nineveh was a prosperous city too, right on the banks of the Tigris River. It was the capital of Assyria. It was the Assyrians that defeated Israel and caused their dis dispersion in 722 B.C. The Assyrians were brutal in their treatment of other nations. Assyria was a war machine that could not be stopped. History tells us that often repeated statements of Assyrian kings were, I destroyed, devastated, and burned with fire. If Assyria marched through your town, nothing would be left. Archaeologists have discovered depictions on the walls in these towns that demonstrate the kind of destruction that Assyria would perform. Their rules of warfare was totally up to the soldier. There was no fair play in war. In some cases, the more heads a soldier would bring home, the more prizes he would receive. In other cases, people were forced out of their homes 
people became pilgrims because of the Assyrians. And in one case, they found out that the Assyrians would literally take the skins off of people. Evil to the core. So Jonah had a really difficult task. Going to Nineveh. His brutal enemies that were cruel to human beings. Go to Nineveh. Can you imagine how Jonah felt when the word of the Lord came to him? Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. God attests to the fact that this is a wicked city. Go to Nineveh, Jonah. Their war crimes were exposed to the one who examines the affairs of all men. The blood of martyrs cried out from the ground. And God was ready to respond, Jonah, arise, go to Nineveh. The word of the Lord was a trying word to Jonah. His stomach dropped, his heart, I imagine, racing, his palms sweaty. Arise, Jonah. He felt his mission complicated. He knows that recently God was merciful to a wicked king in Israel in disbelief. And he thinks back to Deuteronomy and remembers the character of God as, as was revealed to Moses. God is a gracious God. Is he planning to be gracious to Nineveh? And so Jonah had a choice to make. He comes face to face with his knowledge of sin and his knowledge of God. And so Jonah decides to take matters in his own hands. Verse 2, but Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish. Has the word of the Lord ever come to you in such a challenging way? Do this thing that you do not want to do. What do you do in those cases? Jonah arose to flee to Tarshish, 2,500 miles in the opposite direction, crossing the Mediterranean Sea. Jonah was ready to go as far away from the mission field as possible. Arise, go to Nineveh. Jonah got up and went to Tarshish. His plan was to go to Tarshish. The Bible says he went down to Joppa and found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare and went down into the ship to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. Jonah that morning, or whenever it was, packed his bags, I imagine very early, not wanting to be seen by anyone, grabbed his life savings, had no plans to return, went down to Joppa, boarded a ship, and went down into the ship, into the belly of the ship, and went down there and fell down to sleep. You can never sleep away the word of the Lord. Jonah had dreams, I imagine. When he arrived at the shore of Joppa, I imagine Jonah seeing a bright future ahead of him. Yes, the word of the Lord wants me to go to Nineveh, but Tarshish will be a better place for me. Maybe I'll be more successful as a prophet in Tarshish. Maybe this is the ship that God has provided. Maybe God is taking me in this direction instead of that one. And so Jonah goes to Joppa. Always remember, friends, that the word of the Lord never comes to make us comfortable. And if you are one who are looking for a relationship with God, don't always look for comfort. Because God knows how to try us. That which we profess to be, God challenges us on. The word of the Lord comes to shake us out of our stupor. The word of the Lord comes to lift us out of our lethargy. The word of the Lord comes to carry us out of our complacency. And the word of the Lord comes to bind and remove our biases. The word of the Lord comes to expose our egotism. So when the word of the Lord comes to Jonah, he had a choice. Do I obey or choose another way? In, his, in this fleeting moment, bad judgment overwhelmed the prophet. 
and the eyes of the seer was blind. And he went the opposite direction. He grabbed his coins, made his, made, made his way to Joppa. And this was the place of a new dream, he thought. Joppa was a new beginning. But this was the beginning of a downward path for Jonah. Down to Joppa, down into the ship, laid down to sleep, and eventually thrown down into the sea, swallowed by a fish. Whenever we walk away from the word of the Lord, there is a guarantee that we'll find ourselves facing immense, intense storms. And so, whenever you ignore the word of the Lord, the only place, the only direction one can go is down. You always go down to Joppa when you ignore the word of the Lord. But this downward journey was like a small snowball that kept rolling and rolling downhill that eventually became an avalanche and swallowed Jonah. Jonah went down into the sea. When you run from God, a place like Joppa is too small. A ship even smaller. The world becomes too small when you run away from God. So my point, don't run away from God. Where can you go? David, the psalmist, reminds us, asking that great question in life, where can I go to flee from your presence? If I go to the uttermost parts of the earth, you are there. But Jonah is such an interesting character in that. He would rather go the longer distance to go away from God than to go the shorter distance to do the will of God. Friends, that's you and I. Why would this prophet take such an extreme approach? Why is he running? Jonah tells us in Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2. After Jonah went to Nineveh, and by the way, he didn't put in much effort in preaching the message. Jonah preached an eight-word sermon as if to say he doesn't care if they get the message or not. He did not even include God in his message. He just said, this city will be destroyed. And then the people of Nineveh, lacking context, repented, changed their way, even though Jonah held part of the message back. And Jonah, we find him here, verse 10. After God responds to Nineveh, we read, Then God saw their works, that they turned from the evil way, and God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. Jonah chapter 3 and verse 10. Verse 1 of chapter 4, Jonah's response. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Why was he angry? He said to himself, so he prayed. Actually, not even to him, he prayed. Jonah was a prayer warrior. He prayed talking to the Lord about his anger. He says here, and he said, Ah, oh, Lord, was not this what I said when I was still in my country? Therefore I fled previously to Tarshish, for I know that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, one who relents from doing harm. Jonah was upset because of who God is. Jonah was upset because God refuses to be managed by the prophet. If the prophet had his way, Nineveh would be destroyed. And so Jonah was upset because God spared the city. Jonah was upset because of grace. God is gracious, and he's upset over it. My, when we read this text, friends, we have to take our eyes off of Jonah just a little bit and see ourselves because this is who we are. How dare God extend grace to my enemy? Let him extend grace to my friends, the people I love. But how dare God extend grace to my enemy, the people who batter and bruise us, the people who, 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 who mistreat us? How dare God extend grace to them? It makes me upset. So Jonah... He's now dealing with his anger issues. 
Just imagine a prophet being an angry prophet. Can you imagine if Jonah was in church this morning, how you would probably treat him? What kind of questions would you ask Jonah? Jonah, how dare you be upset at the grace of God? You should be ashamed of yourself. You who say you are a prophet, how dare you refuse to extend grace and preach the word of God to those in Nineveh? For Jonah, as the wise prophet I imagine he was, would say to you and I, how dare you look at me? Because the book of Jonah is not about Jonah. Even though he is used in this story, the book of Jonah is not about Jonah. When I was working with some young people some years ago at a summer camp called FLAG, Fun Learning About God, I remember there was a pastor who was deemed the great storyteller. And a part of his skill was to tell stories and leaving cliffhangers. He mastered the skill of cliffhangers. He would tell a story to the kids, and he would go on and on and on and on, and then he got to the point and he would say, I will tell you more tomorrow. And the kids would be, oh, why, pastor, would you do that to us? But they would come tomorrow. And they were all excited to hear the rest of the story. And they would look intently at the pastor. And I, me and I remember I would be there preaching sermons, and they were not as attentive to my sermon. And I said, man, I wish I could tell stories with cliffhangers. And just recently, I was studying with uh, a good friend of mine, and just totally by accident, every time we end our study, we always end on a cliffhanger. And I was like, Lord, you answered my prayer. The book of Jonah ends with a cliffhanger, an unanswered question that you and I must ponder for the rest of eternity. The unanswered question is this, Jonah chapter 4, verse 11. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and much livestock in the book of Jonah ends right there. God asked Jonah the question, should I not have pity on Nineveh? Jonah had pity on a plant, but he had no pity for Nineveh. And Jonah wished that God would not have pity on Nineveh. And God now, in re re reminding Jonah, responding to his complaint, should I not, as if negotiating with the prophet, should I not have pity? Are you, are you saying there, Jonah, that I should not have pity? Is it not my choice to extend pity to whoever I want to? That's the question you and I come face to face with. The book of Jonah ends this way, friends, I believe, because the book of Jonah is continued to this day. You and I are Jonah. Because when you and I look at Jonah, we come to one of two conclusions. Jonah is not saved. Jonah is a horrible prophet. Jonah is a terrible person. Jonah would be berated by us today if he were in town. And most of the sermons preached on Jonah tend to go that way. But the same question comes to you and I. How dare you decide what happens to Jonah? Because the whole story of Jonah is God extending pity to a bad prophet, just as much as he extended pity to a bad city. You see, when Jonah went to Joppa and went down into the ship, he asked the men to throw him overboard. He wanted to die, but God sent a fish. God spared Jonah's life. Jonah went to the city of Nineveh, preached the message unwillingly. 
and comes outside of the city, sitting down, watching and waiting to see if fire is going to come down. Nothing happens. And then Jonah is upset and God provides shade for Jonah. You see, the thing is about the book of Jonah is that it teaches us the beauty, as ugly as the book of Jonah is, it teaches us the beauty of grace. The prophet did not deserve anything from the God he served. And so when you look at the book of Jonah, take your eyes off the ugly prophet and look at the beautiful God he serves. Because God is a God of grace. And friends, you and I are standing here today because of grace. And I want to tell you, friends, that I, too, am a Jonah because I was an enemy of God. Not deserving anything from such a good God. But then grace, friends. Grace, as the Apostle Paul says. Where sin abound, grace did much more abound. And friends, when you look at Jonah with the perspective, the eyes of a sinner, you miss the picture of grace. So God is so wonderful. As, 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 as one of the, 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 the Martin Luther, the champion of grace, he came to this conclusion he said of Jonah, you must visualize Jonah's frame of mind and his dilemma. He does not see a spark of life left in him, nor any hope of rescue. Jonah comes to the conclusion that he, he should die. Nothing but death, yes, death confronts him. And he must despair of life and surrender to death. And friends, that's the journey you and I are we're on until Jesus found us and gave us life. Grace, such a powerful thing. Grace, that mighty vessel through which God saves humanity. What is the conclusion of the book of Jonah despite his ugliness? The point is this, friends. When you look at the book of Jonah, the question is, how could God save the prophet? And God would respond by saying to you, how dare you decide how I use my grace? It's his prerogative. God is capable of rescuing a failing prophet. When you look at Jonah, you must see beyond the mistakes of the prophet. And you must see yourself reflected in the book. Because you too are running from the very grace that God wants to use to save you. And Jonah was running because he could not believe that God would be just as gracious to his enemies as he was to him. And the moment you come to that conclusion, you find yourself running from him. When Jesus spoke of Jonah, we read in Matthew chapter 12, verse 38 to 42. Jesus answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jesus now looks at his life through the lens of the book of Jonah. For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will rise up in the judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented at the preaching of a faulty prophet. And then Jesus says, indeed, a greater than Jonah is here. Jesus says a greater than Jonah is here. He didn't condemn the prophet. The implication is that Jonah is not as great as Jesus. He's not as great as Jesus, but he's great. The implication is that Jonah is not a subpar prophet. Jesus is greater than Jonah. That does not render the prophet useless. Friends, the point of Jonah's story is this. When you look at him, your conclusion must be, praise God for his grace. Do you conclude that Jonah does not deserve anything from God? 
And if you do, that's the right conclusion. But then don't stop there. God gave the prophet what he did not deserve. As he did for Nineveh. Jonah went down into a boat, tossed overboard. God worked a miracle to save a disobedient prophet. Jonah was upset in the heat of the sun. God provided shade for him. This is a picture of grace. There's a text in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, that I want you to ponder upon, consider this morning. The Apostle Paul, concluding on his life journey, pictures himself with his gifts and talents, challenging a church that doubted his potential, his ability, men challenging him for who he was. He comes to this conclusion. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. Do you get to that point in your experience where you see that your gifts and talents are not yours, but you are who you are simply because of the grace of God? Friends, it is a shame when we come to church and think that we are better than others. It is a shame when we think that our gifts make us better than other people. Because then we lose sight of that which is most important, the grace of God. And the moment you conclude that your gifts make you who you are, you are running from the grace of God. And gifts are never a good substitute for grace. We are who we are because of grace. The preacher is who he is because of grace. The playing field is leveled. Nineveh received the grace of God just as I did. Paul says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. I just love that. His grace toward me was not in vain. It was not rendered vain because I allowed the grace of God to change me. And so now when I look at my own life, I don't see me. I see the grace of God. If I preach now and my sermon is a good sermon, praise God because it was his grace that landed me there. If I sing and it's a good song, friends, it wasn't because I was gifted. It's because of his grace. If I now talk better, it's because of the grace of God. And the doctrine of grace is so powerful, it's so beautiful that we ought to contemplate it every single day. I wake up in the morning because God extended his grace to me. I am what I am because of the grace of God. But I labored more abundantly, Paul says, I labored more abundantly, more abundantly than they ought then they all, he's not comparing himself to them. But he doesn't arrive at the same conclusion they arrived at. Because they think they were better than Paul. Paul is not a great speaker. Paul is short. Paul is this. Paul is that. The Apostle Paul says, but the grace of God, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me. Every single day, you ought to make the same conclusion. I do what I do in this local church because the grace of God was with me. Friends, it is not about you. It has never been about you. It's about Jesus and what he can do for you. And if we make it to heaven at last, friends, it's going to be because of Jesus and his grace. You know you don't deserve to be here today. You know you should have been in the depths of the ocean, dying, dead. But the grace of God rescued you. And you are here today because of his grace. Why don't we love him more? He is so good. I feel like saying amen because you're not saying it. <laughs> ah. John Newton, the great preacher. We're going to close here. John Newton, the great preacher, was in the final years of his life. He had lost his sight. Couldn't read anymore, even though he loved reading the scriptures. And a friend of him came over for breakfast one morning, and their tradition was to read the scriptures after they eat the meal. And they'll read a text, and John Newton was co would comment on the text. 
And this morning, the passage that they read was this very same passage by the Apostle Paul. By the grace of God, I am what I am. And John Newton heard the words. And his normal thing to do was to listen and then make a remark, a comment on the passage of Scripture. His friend waited intently for John Newton to say something, but he didn't. They waited in the silence. And finally, John Newton mentioned this. The passage that pierced his heart, and this is what he said. I am not what I ought to be. How imperfect and deficient I am. I am not what I wish to be. Although I abhor that which is evil and would cleave to that which is good, I am not what I hope to be, but soon I shall be out of mortality, and with, sin, with all sin, um, I should be out of uh, mortality with all its sin and imperfection. And though I am not what I ought to be, nor what I wish to be, nor yet what I hope to be, I can truly say that I am not what I once was. A slave to sin and Satan. I can hardly join with the apostle and acknowledge that by the grace of God I am what I am. When we get to the end of our lives, that should be our statement. I am what I am because of the grace of God of God. Friends, again, it's not about you. It's not about Jonah. It's about the God he served. But that's it. God revealed the ugliness of a man's character to reveal the beauty of his grace. Jonah became vulnerable to the gaze of all of us. And can you imagine if your story was written in scripture, exposed to the world to see for all generations? How would it read? Friends, if my story is to be read in scripture, I want at the end of it, it should clearly say, he is who he is because of the grace of God. Oh, friends, this is mind-blowing. The love that God has for us faulty people. We can never exhaust the beauty of grace. And throughout all eternity, that will be a subject we'll study. Don't think you have a handle on God. Don't think you can decide what he does with his grace. And so when Jesus says, love your enemies, pray for those who accuse you, and pray for those who despitefully despitefully, um, uh, treat you or use you, There you go. Thank you. He is serious because he wants you to see a picture of him. When we were enemies, Jesus died for us. With that said, I'll end the sermon. I'll land the plane. Amen. And with that said, why don't you stand with me as we pray and thank the Lord for his grace. Father, we come today with gratitude on our lips because of who you are. Many of us in this room do not deserve to be here, but God, because of who you are, we are here. You've spared our lives when we were on the downward path into the depths of the ocean we found ourselves, but yet there you came and rescued us. And Father, we're so thankful because you are a mighty God. And your grace is powerful. And you are a God who is mighty to save. And we praise your name. The English language is insufficient to thank you for all that you've done for us. So Lord, with this small gesture, the only thing we can do really is to surrender our lives to you. So once more, Father, we give ourselves to you, asking that your grace may do its perfect work in us, that we may be made new, that we may be made more like you. That if we ever get a disturbing call, like what Jonah received, 
wanting us to go to Nineveh, to the places we don't want to go. Father, we pray by your grace that you may rescue us and help us to go on your errands and not to do our own will. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, Amen. Amen. Thank you. I think it's time for our closing song. What a powerful message, the grace of God. Um, I know I talk a lot of times up here explaining so many things about songs in the message, but I just can't stop myself from sharing that. It's beautiful to hear that the grace of God towards us is without limit. And because of that, I want to invite you to sing with all your heart, holy, 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 to praise his name and reflect and meditate as we sing these words that this may be your prayer towards him. Holy, holy, holy. song move me it's time for the benediction glory be to him who can keep you from falling and bring you safe to his glorious presence innocent and happy to God 
the only God who saves us through Jesus Christ our Lord, be the glory, majesty, authority, and power, which he had before time began, now and forever. Amen. Amen.